India is surrounded by enemies, and it's preparing to retaliate with war. Video has surfaced of a skirmish in a disputed region on the India-China border. Clashes that we've heard reports about for years along the border between the world's two most populous nations that both happen to have nuclear weapons. India and Pakistan, the territorial dispute over the Kashmir region became a flashpoint between the two. Kashmir is the central factor in the India-Pakistan dispute. This year, in what was an unprecedented move heightened by the hostility from China particularly, India increased its defense budget by over 13 percent, making it one of the top five biggest military spenders globally. On top of that, it has been reported that Indian officials commissioned a study to examine the wider impact of any war with China that also involves the U.S. and its allies, and what action India could take in response. This just shows you that matters have reached a point of no return. This is the same pattern that we've seen happen with Russia and Ukraine in Europe, Israel and Palestine in the Middle East, and now India, China, and other nations I'll cover right there in Asia. The same pattern of death and despair is raising its ugly head. But now, as it drags superpowers into the mix, is anyone anywhere truly safe anymore? To understand just what is happening, we need to put ourselves in India's geographic and geopolitical shoes. From this perspective, as we view the mega nation's geographic crisis, some of whose issues are inherited from a past time, we can better understand the impact that these matters are having in modern society, and how best we can address them as a global community. Left ignored, we might prove to be the villains of history, as death and despair will be the legacy of an ignorant world all emanating from Asia. Before starting, I want to talk about the problems that make understanding international news so difficult. The news we read might not have a local, on-the-ground perspective. And just because a journalist is reporting on an issue, it doesn't mean they're an expert on it. So cross-referencing information we come across is absolutely vital if we want a clear understanding of what's happening in our world. And that's where today's sponsor, Ground News, comes in. They're an app and a website that gather related articles from across the world and political spectrum to make in-depth story overviews like this one. This overview is based on 75 articles they found reporting on China and India's border dispute. I can either quickly catch up using their summary of this issue from different political viewpoints, or scroll down to see all my options of articles to read. And because I don't live anywhere near this conflict, I really value having local perspectives. And looking at their map, I can see most of these articles are, in fact, coming out of India. Aside from location tags under each article, I also get insight on who owns its source, how reliable their reporting is, and which way they politically lean. Context that lets me know which perspective their report is coming from. For example, this article from the Chinese government says India's reaction over China claiming Arunachal Pradesh as its own serves an election purpose, while this one coming out of India focuses on the US opposing China's claims. One article couldn't possibly fit all the insight I gained from their story overviews, which is why I really trust them as a reliable source of information. And because they're nonpartisan and independent, I know their only agenda is making sure there's complete transparency on the issues that I care the most about. So I really think you should check them out by going to ground.news slash basics. My link gets you 40% off the plan I use, their unlimited access vantage plan. Follow your favorite topics and let me know what you learn. So first off, let's talk about India. This is where India lies on the global map. This nation, which happens to be the world's most populous nation, occupies the greater part of South Asia. India is made up of 28 states and 8 union territories, and it so happens to be the 7th largest country by area. This is basic information, which I'm sure most of you probably already know. What perhaps is of interest are the neighbors that India shares its borders with. This is where its geopolitical crisis really rears its ugly head. You see, India shares its land borders with seven countries, namely Afghanistan, Pakistan, China, Bhutan, Nepal, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. It then shares its maritime border with two other nations, the Maldives and Sri Lanka. The problem for India is that 
Well, it has less than pleasant relations with its neighbors. In fact, its immediate foreign policy can rightfully be called a crisis. What is the reason behind this? Well, we need to dive in and break it down on a case-by-case -case basis. Something that, you know, I'm all too happy to do for you. Let's start with one of these relationships. The one between India and Pakistan. Not many people know of this land dispute, and rightfully so. Outside of Asia, it's not really highlighted that much. Unfortunately, it is these hidden sources of tension that burst out violently, much like the Israel, Lebanon, and Palestine issues. If the last two years in geopolitics have taught you anything, it should be that any time can be wartime. So, back to Pakistan. The story of Pakistan starts with the British Raj. The British Raj was the period of British rule on the Indian subcontinent between 1858 and 1947, for around 89 years of British occupation. At the end of it, in July 1947, about five weeks before the British were scheduled to depart the Indian subcontinent, Sir Cyril Radcliffe, a British lawyer, was commissioned to draw the borders that would divide British India into two countries, Muslim-majority Pakistan and Hindu-majority India. Yes, the British had decided to partition the large Indian nation by religious affinity, and it had now come down to Muslims and Hindus. Cyril Radcliffe, who was on his first ever trip to India, had the monumental task of drawing the base of his lines on the population of Muslims and Hindus, in addition to quote-unquote other factors. These additional factors were never officially defined, but are believed to include economic and communication resources, such as irrigation channels and railway lines. The Radcliffe Line was officially announced on August 17, 1947, a few days after the independence of India and Pakistan. Crudely, this division, based upon religious affiliation, culminated in the formal creation of a Muslim majority in the West and East Pakistan, and Hindu majority in India. This map here gives you a better mental picture of this whole affair. These newly demarcated borders resulted in one of the biggest human migrations in modern history. Punjab's mostly Muslim western part went to Pakistan, and its mostly Hindu and Sikh eastern part went to India. But there were significant Muslim minorities in Punjab's eastern section. And light Hindus and Sikhs minorities living in Punjab, there was no conception that population transfers would be necessary because of the partitioning. Religious minorities were expected to stay put in the states they found themselves residing in. However, an exception was made for Punjab, which did not apply to other provinces. Intense communal rioting in Punjab forced the governments of India and Pakistan to agree to a forced population exchange of Muslim and Hindu-slash-Sikh minorities living in Punjab. After this population exchange, only a few thousand Hindus remained in Pakistani Punjab, and only a tiny Muslim population remained in the town of Malekotla, in India's part of Punjab. The numbers are fuzzy, but it's largely thought that more than 10 million people migrated across the new borders and between 200,000 and 2 million people died in the horrible violence that followed such a drastic change. The violence between the Muslims that would form Pakistan and the Hindus that would form India would later be considered retributive genocide between the religions. Among the casualties of this horrid affair, the Pakistani government claimed that 50,000 Muslim women were abducted by Hindu and Sikh men, and similarly, the Indian government claimed that Muslims abducted 33,000 Hindu and Sikh women. This conflict was very easy, and it sowed the seeds of the hate between the two nations that still exist to this very day. Ultimately, the two governments agreed to repatriate abducted women, and thousands of Hindu, Sikh, and Muslim women were repatriated to their families in the 1950s. A dispute arose over the state of Jammu and Kashmir. This was a contentious area that had a predominantly Muslim population, but a Hindu leader, and shared borders with both India and West Pakistan. The argument over which nation would incorporate the state escalated into the first war between India and Pakistan. With the assistance of the United Nations, the war was ended, but it became the Kashmir dispute, unresolved as of 2023. Kashmir joined the Republic of India, but the Pakistani government continued to believe that the majority Muslim state rightfully belonged to Pakistan. It is this festering, untreated wound that would come back to haunt the region again just a few years later, 
when conflict resumed again in early 1965. That year, Pakistani and Indian forces clashed over disputed territory along the border between the two nations. Hostilities intensified that August when the Pakistani army attempted to take Kashmir by force. The attempt to seize the state was unsuccessful, and the Second India-Pakistan War reached a stalemate. This time, the international politics of the Cold War affected the nature of the conflict. You see, the United States had a history of having mixed feelings with relations with India. During the 1950s, U.S. officials regarded Indian leadership with some caution due to India's involvement in the non-aligned movement, particularly its prominent role at the Bandung Conference in 1955. The United States hoped to maintain a regional balance of power, which meant not allowing India to influence the political development of other states. However, a 1962 border conflict between India and China ended with a decisive Chinese victory, which motivated the United States and the United Kingdom to provide military supplies to the Indian Army. I'll cover this when we talk about China-India relations soon. After the clash with China, India also turned to the Soviet Union for assistance, which placed some strain on U.S.-Indian relations. However, the United States somewhat got over it and also provided India with considerable development assistance through the 1960s and the 1970s. On the other hand, U.S.-Pakistani relations had been more consistently positive. The U.S. government looked to Pakistan as an example of a moderate Muslim state and appreciated Pakistani assistance in holding the line against communist expansion by joining the Southeast Asia Treaty in 1954 and the Baghdad Pact, later renamed the Central Treaty Organization in 1955. Pakistan's interest in these pacts stemmed from its desire to develop its military and defensive capabilities which were substantially weaker than those of India. Both the United States and the United Kingdom supplied arms to Pakistan in these years. So that's what the US felt regarding both states, making matters a bit more complicated. After Pakistani troops invaded Kashmir, India moved quickly to internationalize the regional dispute. It asked the United Nations to reprise its role in the first India-Pakistani war and end the current conflict. The Security Council passed Resolution 211 on September 20th, calling for an end to the fighting and negotiations on the settlement of the Kashmir problem. And the United States and the United Kingdom supported the UN decision by cutting off arms supplies to both nations. This ban affected both nations, but Pakistan felt the effects more intensely, since it had a much weaker military in comparison to India. The UN resolution and the halting of arms sales had an immediate impact. India accepted the ceasefire on September 21st and Pakistan on September 22nd. However, this was exactly that, just a ceasefire. The ceasefire alone did not resolve the status of Kashmir, and both sides accepted the Soviet Union as a third-party mediator. Negotiations in Tashkent concluded in January of 1966, with both sides giving up territorial claims and withdrawing their armies from the disputed territories. Nevertheless, although the Tashkent Agreement achieved its short-term aims, conflict in South Asia would reignite a few years later. This sounds like script déjà vu, but a few short years later, war reignited in South Asia. This time with very interesting outcomes in the grand scheme of things. 1971 saw a war start again between India and Pakistan. Perhaps of all the wars fought between them, this was the most defining one. Let's go through it, shall we? Do you remember a few minutes ago when I talked about how the British drew lines splitting India and Pakistan? I mentioned that there were two Pakistanis, remember that? Well, the partitions of India in 1947 created West and East Pakistan, two non-contiguous territories that shared a dominant religion of Islam, but were very different in terms of language, ethnicity, and culture. In the 1970 parliamentary elections, an overwhelming number of East Pakistanis voted for a political party that advocated autonomy for the East. But it was blocked from governing by the army and the existing Pakistani government, and its leader was jailed. The resulting mass protests in the East were brutally suppressed by the Pakistani army, which caused a massive refugee movement into neighboring India. East Pakistani guerrilla forces, supported by India, fought with the Pakistani army in the late autumn of 1971. West Pakistan responded with air attacks on India directly, an action that spurred an open war between the two powers. 
This war itself was an international crisis, one that the U.S. found itself smack dab in the middle of. The United States faced several dilemmas in how to respond to the crisis. The regional situation was already complex. India signed a treaty of mutual assistance with the Soviet Union in August of 1971, and the People's Republic of China was friendly to Pakistan and had fought a war with India in 1962. These partnerships made war in South Asia very volatile and explosive. However, Pakistan was a valuable diplomatic partner, and its government helped the United States achieve a rapprochement with the People's Republic of China in the early 1970s. After President Richard Nixon's visit in 1969, the U.S. government resumed selling Pakistan military equipment, a process that had been disrupted by the previous 1965 India-Pakistan war. And Washington wished to avoid a second war between Pakistan and India, but they also feared that Pakistan would be greatly weakened if its eastern province broke off, and so supported Pakistan initially. However, the action against the mass protest in East Pakistan was well publicized and widely condemned, which limited the extent to which the U.S. government was willing to help the Pakistani government prevent the division of its country. It's interesting how much power a man with a camera holds when the world is paying attention. In the end, the United States acted in a somewhat ambiguous manner during the brief 1971 war. The USS Enterprise carrier group from Vietnam moved towards the Bay of Bengal, stopping in Singapore and eventually reaching Sri Lanka. This action signaled to the Soviet Union and China that it was possible that the United States would assist Pakistan. However, by not ordering direct intervention, the United States also conveyed to both India and Pakistan the message that the U.S. commitment to intervention in South Asia had limits. This ambiguity would produce negative results for U.S. influence in the region. It would be the beginning of the weakening of its influence in a region it so badly wanted to call the shots in. On the other hand, India's relationship with the Soviet Union ensured that the United Nations would not intervene and help deter China from opening a second conflict on India's northern border. Defeated on both fronts, Pakistan was forced to let go of its eastern province. This resulted in the establishment of an independent Bangladesh in place of East Pakistan. Bangladesh was admitted to the United Nations in 1974, cutting off Pakistan's territory and influence, further worsening hostilities between the nations. The loss of Pakistan, the emergence of Bangladesh, and the limited U.S. involvement resulted in a decline in U.S. influence in South Asia, and India's emergence as the most significant power on the subcontinent. U.S. prestige was damaged in both nations, in Pakistan for failing to help prevent the loss of East Pakistan, and in India for supporting the brutality of the Pakistanis' regime actions in what became Bangladesh. The U.S. was a universal loser in a war it didn't even fight in. On the other hand, and much to the annoyance of the U.S., the Soviet relationship with India became stronger, a fact that took on greater significance with India's rise to prominence in the region. In the long run, the 1971 war increased competition between India and Pakistan, forcing the United States to maintain its focus on regional developments. You know, I would love to say this was the end of the conflict between the two South Asian nations, but it wasn't. The last war that took place between the two, the Kargil War, took place at the turn of the century in 1999. Once again, as they had often done in the past, India and Pakistan squabbled over disputed land. The land in question was Kargil, a sector of the disputed Kashmir region located along the line of control that demarcates the Pakistan and India-administered portions of Kashmir. The sector had often been the site of border skirmishes between the two countries, and the Kargil War was the largest and deadliest of these clashes. The conflict began in early May, when the Indian military learned that Pakistani fighters had infiltrated the Indian-administrated territory. After detecting the infiltration, India ordered its army and air force to push back the intruders, who included regulars of the Pakistani army. The bitter fighting took place in harsh terrain 16,400 feet above sea level, while intensive diplomatic activity took place elsewhere. Think of it as a war on two fronts, physical and diplomatic. In trying to address the matter, Pakistani Foreign Minister Sartaj Aziz visited New Delhi on June 12th. But his talks with Indian External Affairs Minister Jaswant Singh failed to produce results. Meetings of military leaders from both countries followed, 
And in the weeks ahead, the international community asserted the need for Pakistan to return to the line of control. Eventually, on July 11th, Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif announced that the militants would withdraw, and India gave them until July 16th to do so. Sporadic fighting continued even after the deadline, however. Several hundred combatants were killed on each side during the conflict. Thousands of people near the line of control were also moved due to the fighting. Ever since then, there have been several skirmishes between the two nations. I'll just run down a few of these critical armed transgressions between the two nations from 1999 to date. I'll be brief, so listen closely. Shortly after the 1999 war, in December of 2001, five armed terrorists entered the Indian parliament building and opened fire, killing nine people. India blamed Pakistani-backed Kashmiri militants for the attack, which led to a massive buildup of troops along the Indo-Pakistani border. A few years later, in February of 2007, blasts in two coaches of the Sam Joda Express killed 68 people, most of them Pakistani nationals. What made these killings especially emotional was that the train was created in 1994 as a goodwill measure to help families who were separated during the 1947 India-Pakistan partition. To bomb the very train was then to blow up a sign of reconciliation between the two states. This action came at a time when relations were improving between India and Pakistan. The following year, in 2008, 10 Pakistani men associated with the terror group lashkar e toriba stormed various buildings in Mumbai and killed 164 people using automatic weapons and grenades. Only one of the 10 gunmen survived and was executed in 2012. In February of 2019, the Pakistani-based terror group jaish e mohammed carried out a car bomb attack in Indian-controlled Kashmir, which resulted in the deaths of over 40 members of India's paramilitary forces. India retaliated with airstrikes across the line of control, and Pakistan shot down an Indian aircraft and captured a pilot. These actions significantly increased tensions between the two nuclear states, but two days later, the Indian pilot was released and tensions relaxed. However, all these small incidents consistently put strains on the relationship between the two nations, further adding to the geographic crisis between the two countries and the region. In August of 2019, in a controversial and unexpected move, the Indian government revoked Article 370, which grants Indian-administered Kashmir autonomy. Article 370 gave Kashmir the rights to its own constitution, a separate flag, and freedom to make laws regarding residency, property ownership, and fundamental rights. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi argued that the article needed to be scrapped in order to put Kashmir on the same footing as the rest of India. Pakistan stayed relatively silent following this decision, but did highlight the violence Kashmiris had experienced since August. Bringing it to the modern day, the crisis between Pakistan and India poses quite the challenge in global geopolitics. What presents a large problem is that both of these nations are nuclear-armed. That means, unlike in the past, any sort of modern war might get ugly really quickly. This point is further supported by their different nuclear strategies. The nuclear doctrine of Pakistan states that first strike policy is allowed, although the strike would only be initiated if, and only if, the Pakistan armed forces are unable to halt an invasion, as, for example, in the 1971 war or a nuclear strike is launched against Pakistan. On the other hand, India has declared a policy of no first use. According to a peer-reviewed study published in the Journal of Nature Food in August of 2022, a nuclear war between India and Pakistan could kill more than 2 billion indirectly by starvation during a nuclear winter. That is not a good thing, and that is about 25% of the global population, not factoring in direct casualties. It is perhaps a good thing, then, that India understands the full ramifications of this, as the Prime Minister spoke at the International Sikh Convention in the eastern Pakistani city of Lahore in 2019. We are two nuclear-armed countries. If tensions rise, then there is a danger to the world from this. From our side, we will never act first. As this conflict is affecting the political diplomacy side of matters, it's also critical that I brush over their economies. The two countries, India and Pakistan, inherited similar economies, marked by neglect and underinvestment from their past colonizers. However, 77 years later, the difference between both couldn't be starker. 
On one hand, while India is poised to become the third largest economy in the world, Pakistan is facing economic and political instability and struggling to stay afloat. According to the World Bank, India's GDP stood at over $3.39 trillion as of 2022 more than 800% greater than the 376.53 billion GDP of Pakistan. When it comes to the GDP per capita of both countries, India's GDP per capita is nearly 50% more than that of Pakistan today. Perhaps, ever so subtly, Pakistan still harbors a grudge for this economic deficiency. You see, Pakistan benefited immensely from the trade of East Pakistan, which accounted for as much as 70% of the country's export earnings during its early years. When the nation lost its crown jewel, which grew to be Bangladesh, its economic might was quite repressed. If they are bearing the hurt to this day, it makes sense that maybe, just maybe, they bear the same grudge, formed from decades of a major geographic crisis. As we dive into this topic, please take a second to like this video. As you can see, I have an affinity for covering topics that no one else likes to talk about. And really, that doesn't often get me on the right side of the algorithm. So your likes really help out the videos a lot. While we're on that note, let's talk about Bangladesh. You would think that Bangladesh and India would be natural partners, as the former successfully seceded from Pakistan with the latter's help and direct military intervention. Well, it's not quite as simple. At present, there are deep-rooted conflicts and distrust between the two nations. There are several points of contention between India and Bangladesh, starting with asymmetrical trade. Cheaper Indian goods flow across the porous border into Bangladesh and impede the development of local industries. At the same time, non-tariff barriers under the South Asian Free Trade Agreement continue to create major obstacles for Bangladesh's exports. In terms of natural resources, Indian water management practices upstream have long impacted negatively on Bangladesh's own water management, contributing to localized drought and flood control problems. Meanwhile, on the security front, bilateral tensions arise from India's claim that insurgent bases on the Bangladeshi side of its northeastern border provide safe haven for Indian secessionist groups. India is also concerned about the large number of illegal immigrants from Bangladesh that it believes are working in India. These concerns led India to construct a steel fence along its 2,500-mile border with Bangladesh. Frequent cases of unarmed villagers in Bangladesh being shot by the Indian Border Security Force have further strained bilateral ties. Sustained bilateral tensions are not in New Delhi's interest. India needs a stable and prosperous Bangladesh to support its own efforts to improve governance and maintain security and territorial integrity. Specifically, India needs improved access through Bangladesh to reduce the exclusion of its remote northeastern states, such as Meghalaya, Tripura, and Mizoram, which lag behind much of the rest of the country in terms Bangladesh, too, could benefit from improved relations. Indian investment could help Bangladesh begin exploiting its hard-to-reach gas reserves and address its chronic electricity shortage. Bangladesh now has aspirations to join the BRICS as one of the next 11 countries, but it'll need foreign investment if it's to achieve its goal. Given Bangladesh's strategic location between South and Southeast Asia, it could benefit from the resurgence of India and China and strengthen its diplomatic hand. But Bangladesh can only take advantage of this growing regional clout if it can steer a course that maintains good relations with both of these giant powers. The government of Sheikh Hasina has made a good start by revitalizing diplomatic initiatives with India in the past few years. Although there have been setbacks, these have already borne fruit in the form of a cooperation agreement on cross-border terrorist groups and a billion-dollar Indian investment plan. These initiatives build on earlier successful bilateral projects, such as the kolkata dhaka rail link established in 2007. But much more needs to be done to cement relations around equitable water sharing, border security, and bilateral trade. The summarized version of this geographical crisis that India has as it pertains to Bangladesh is this. Bangladeshis have developed something of a love-hate relationship with India. On one hand, the nation is grateful for India's support in 1971 and mindful of a common culture and shared history. But it is very resentful of the ways that India throws its weight around as the regional superpower. Bangladeshis in general are very independent-minded people who do not like anyone playing Big Brother. 
And it is not a surprise that India has become increasingly unpopular in Bangladesh these days. India would be better off stepping back a bit from its dominating stance. It is not lost to the Bangladeshi population that hard-working expatriates send home over $12 billion annually by working the toughest jobs in the Middle East and other places. An equal amount is also remitted out of Bangladesh by a small number of Indians occupying key positions in both local and foreign companies. This is ironic, because Bangladesh has many qualified locals who could easily fill those jobs. So, yes, that in a nutshell describes the Indo-Bangladesh relationship. Moving on to the next neighbor, and perhaps India's biggest geographic crisis focus in the region, China. India and China, two global superpowers, share a 2,167-mile border, which the two countries have disputed for close to a century now. As I hinted to a few minutes ago, these two countries went to war over this border in 1962, ending with a standoff that continues, well, to this day. A modern war between these two armed and nuclear nations would be devastating. When you factor in the fact that, combined, the countries account for 35% of the global population and 21% of the global GDP, you start to have a measure of how disastrous conflict between these two can prove to be. The border itself is divided into three sections and constitutes one of the longest contested borders in the world. The first section stretches east of Bhutan, where the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh is claimed by the Chinese to be a part of southern Tibet. The second section is a narrow 50-mile stretch of land that spans between Nepal and Bhutan. This, this border region is small but strategically important to India in that it connects India's far eastern states with the bulk of the country. Parts of this region are claimed by Bhutan in addition to China and India. The third section runs north of Tibet and borders the Indian territory of Ladakh and the Chinese region of Aksai Chin. China and India dispute the location of each of these borders. The border region is especially mountainous, resulting in poorly defined boundaries, so accidental incursions are common. Furthermore, similar to other borders drawn during the colonial period, the Sino-Indian border had little consent from the two countries, especially China. China claims to share historical and cultural ties with the people on the Indian side of the border. Also, the Ladakh region is the base for the Tibetan independence movement and potentially provides China with a more direct pathway to Pakistan. Given how good China-Pakistan relations are, this is something they would especially want. The border issue between the two nations did not just come out of thin air, no. It was an issue that was always there that just needed to be clarified, but it never was. You see, after India's independence, three major factors contributed to the entrenchment of the border dispute. First, and perhaps most importantly, was the reluctance of both India and China to broach the subject in the initial phase from 1950 to 1957, when Sino-Indian ties were peaceful and amicable and the two countries had many high-level diplomatic exchanges which provided the leaders with ample opportunities to settle the ambiguities left over from the colonial period. However, the two countries not only avoided the boundary issue, but also followed unilateral policies. This would come back to haunt them later on. The Indian government failed to consult China before declaring the forward-most posts in the eastern and western sectors. It annexed Tawang in 1951 and it published new maps reflecting India's unilateral demarcation. Throughout all of this, China said nothing, and India mistakenly interpreted China's silence as tacit consent. Jawaharlal Nehru, India's former prime minister, admitted in 1953 that even while India inherited the McMahon line from the British, he was not so willing to raise the subject lest it awaken sleeping dogs. Similarly, per Mao Zedong's instructions, the People's Republic of China followed a delaying strategy, with China deciding to refrain from formally protesting against New Delhi's unilateral moves until they had consolidated their administrative and military positions in Tibet, as China had begun building the Xinjiang National Highway in 1951, a road that would not be completed until 1957. Moreover, during the 1954 negotiations on Tibet, China chose not to raise the issue of border alignment despite having the opportunity. And in 1956, when Nehru for the first time referred to the boundary issue, Chou Enlai, former premier of the People's Republic of China, 
suggested that the Chinese government would be willing to recognize the McMahon line. Later scholarly works revealed that a combination of domestic and international factors influenced the policy choices of both countries. For instance, New Delhi's trauma from previous territorial losses due to partition and Nehru's desire to maintain friendly relations with China weighed heavily on Indian decision makers. Simultaneously, Beijing, too embroiled in China's internal struggles and facing international diplomatic isolation, was reluctant to immediately open another confrontational front with India. In retrospect, however, the deferral policy followed by both countries proved to be, well, disastrous. Because as suspicion and misperceptions mounted on both sides, the window of opportunity to settle the border dispute only became narrower. This resulted in the eventual border discussions being, well, not so diplomatic. In fact, the two superpowers fought a war back in 1962 over the disputed territory. This war was precipitated by the 1959 Tibetan Uprising, which subsequently resulted in a series of violent border skirmishes between the two countries. India established a number of outposts along the border. Meanwhile, the Chinese People's Liberation Army was commencing patrols in Ladakh. War broke out in October of 1962, with the PLA pushing Indian forces back. Following international pressure to end the war, the countries established a ceasefire in November, and China withdrew to the line of actual control, which now forms the current border. The casualties from the war were unclear, with both sides understating their own losses and inflating the other side's losses. Several things about the border persist even after the war, and uncertainty over their non-resolution makes the reality of a modern war ever so present for both nations. This is a headache for India and hence one of their biggest geographic crises, this time with perhaps an army that is better than their own. So what are the points argued by each country? Well, remember the three sectors of the border dispute that I mentioned before? India argues that the western sector was demarcated by the 1842 agreement between Tibet and Kashmir, and that the eastern sector was finalized by the Simla agreement in 1913 through 1914. Therefore, no further demarcation is required. China, in turn, states that no formal treaty or agreement has ever been signed between the Indian and Chinese governments. For China, neither sent any representative to the India-Tibet negotiations nor ratified the McMahon line. In this context, China views the establishment of the state of Arunachal Pradesh as a unilateral step by India, and this amounts to an illegal occupation of China's Tibet. From a broader perspective, the two countries disagree, first on the size of the border and the locations which are disputed. The Indian position is that the Sino-Indian boundary is a total of 3,488 kilometers in length, including 523 kilometers of what India calls the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir-China section. With the western sector being 1,597 kilometers, the middle sector 545 kilometers, and the eastern sector 1,346 kilometers in length. Here, India accuses China of occupying 38,000 square kilometers of land in the Kashmir region. Along with 5,180 kilometers of land in the Kashmir region, which was ceded to it by Pakistan. Also, India claims Aksai Chin to be part of India's Ladakh region, and India has no dispute as far as the eastern sector is concerned. On the other hand, as narratives often have, the Chinese position is that the Sino Indian border is not more than 2,000 kilometers. The western sector roughly covers Katakoram Mountain and is about 600 kilometers long. The disputed area in this sector is 33,000 square kilometers and currently lies under Chinese control. The middle sector is roughly 450 kilometers long and has a disputed area of 2,000 square kilometers, and the eastern sector is 650 kilometers and has a disputed area of 90,000 square kilometers occupied by India. Contrary to India's position, China asserts that the eastern sector of the border is the most contentious part, as the McMahon line is illegitimate and China therefore claims the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh. In the western sector, China contends that Ladakh is a disputed region. You can almost understand just why India's former prime minister did not want to open a can of worms, and in his own words, chose to let sleeping dogs lie. 
After fighting a whole war and not having any resolution agreed upon, the two nations had to be obliged by a line of actual control for peace purposes as guided by the international community, even though this peace line has, well, it's been a major issue. The two Asian nations cannot come to a determination of the line of actual control. India rejects the Chinese version of the line of actual control, describing it as a series of disconnected points on a map. New Delhi also claims that the line of actual control should be based on military positions before China's 1962 attack, discounting any gains made during that war. This would be advantageous to them given that they, you know, lost that war soundly. China, on the other hand, insists that the line of actual control should be the status quo attained after the 1962 war, which is incidentally the territorial arrangements suggested by Zhou Enlai during the 1960 negotiations. On the eastern side, it coincides mostly with the McMahon line, while in the western and middle sectors, the line of actual control follows the traditional customary line pointed out by China. However, China only describes it in general terms, without precise scales on the map. Owing to such disagreements between the two countries, the line of actual control, even after 50 years of conflict, remains undemarcated. The demarcation and implementation of the LAC is deeply associated with the larger process of negotiations on border alignment. The Chinese leadership and officials hold the determination of the line of actual control to be a critical matter and have usually followed an extremely reserved approach. In 1999, the issue of demarcation of the line of actual control gained momentum during the visit of India's then external affairs minister, Jaswant Singh. The two sides also formally exchanged their respective maps of the middle sector in 2001. However, one year later, an Indian proposal to set a time frame for exchanging maps and addressing the clarification of the western and eastern sectors failed to elicit a cogent response from China, and the matter stagnated. Indian experts observed that the Chinese lack of interest in providing the clarification on the line of actual control is related to Beijing's shift in policy on the border dispute. In the post-war period, China withdrew the package deal originally proposed by Zhou Enlai, and now claims the entire state of Arunachal Pradesh. Although initially Chinese interest in Arunachal Pradesh were limited only to Tawang, in recent years their claims have expanded to include the entire state. For instance, in 2006, before the visit to India by China's then-president Hu Jintao, the PRC ambassador to India declared all of Arunachal Pradesh to be Chinese territory, and that Tuang was merely a small portion of it. Chinese commenters lament that it was a great political mistake on Chinese part to give up NEFA or modern-day Arunachal Pradesh. In 2007, Chinese Foreign Minister Yang Jiechi stated that the presence in populated areas would not affect Chinese claims a stance that is problematic because it is a clear reversal of Beijing's earlier agreement to abide by the principle to safeguard the interests of the settled populations in the border areas. It also suggests that, in the future, China might unilaterally reject any principle that is inconvenient to its national interests. In response to Indian allegations, China argues that there are two reasons why China is reluctant to demarcate the line of actual control. First, because such a process will take both countries back to the historical disputes and once again entrap bilateral ties within the historical and legal approach, which in turn will inhibit the overall development of Sino-Indian relations. Second, China is charging New Delhi with taking advantage of the clarification process to increase the disputed area into places where no dispute existed before, although Beijing is unable to provide any concrete evidence to support this claim. The border region was relatively quiet until 2017 due to a series of agreements between India and China that maintained the peace. However, in recent years there have been an increase in cross-border violence and disputes, with both sides fortifying their sides of the border. In 2017, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, extended a road into the Doklam region by Bhutan. India responded by sending troops into the region to halt the construction. But by August of that year, both sides had withdrawn their forces. May of 2020 saw another confrontation when Indian and Chinese troops engaged in a series of skirmishes along the border, spurred on by an Indian road construction project in the Ladakh region. While most of these skirmishes merely amounted to face-offs and taunts, a large melee fight broke out in mid-June, resulting in the deaths of 20 Indian soldiers and an unspecified number of Chinese soldiers. The fight only involved hand-to-hand -hand combat 
and did not include the firing of weapons. However, a few months later, both sides began exchanging sporadic gunfire across the border. In the subsequent year, both sides continued to build infrastructure along the border, supporting their claims to each territory. India sent 12,000 workers to develop Indian roads and infrastructure along the border, including a road infrastructure project in Ladakh. Meanwhile, China has been building villages along the eastern portion of the border, some of which are Indian-claimed and Bhutan-claimed territories. Both sides continually claim that the opposite countries are amassing troops along the border and building defensive positions to fortify their claims to the regions. The issue is further complicated by the accusations and bold statements being pushed out by government officials and state-aligned media outlets from both countries. However, with all this said and done, I think that the prospect of a modern war between India and China is something that's not going to happen. Quite simply, neither side would have a substantial benefit from a war. Fighting in the Himalayas is challenging and would rely heavily on dismounted operations. The terrain and weather would make logistics difficult, to say the least, while also destroying soldier morale. Moreover, neither side has a definitive advantage in technology that could prove them an edge in a war. It would be a gruesome battle of attrition, which both sides would naturally want to avoid. Although the overall outcome of this dispute is uncertain, it will likely continue for some time. Both sides appear to be using this border dispute to create a sense of nationalism and restore faith in the federal government, following poor responses to national issues, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic. Media agencies in both countries are pushing out questionable reports about the actions of the opposite country and glorifying their own responses. China has elevated Qi Faobao, a PLA commander injured in the melee with Indian forces in 2020, to being a national icon, including carrying the Olympic torch. Meanwhile, the Indian film industry has launched several television shows and movies centered around the 1962 Sino-Indian War. To add to all of this, both countries are vying for dominance in the region and do not want to appear weak. The border dispute provides both countries the opportunity to flaunt their military and economic strengths. This is critical for both countries, given India's relationship with Pakistan and China's relationship with the West. Chinese media has reported numerous cutting-edge technologies being fielded to the region, including exoskeletons and armed robots. While both technologies provided little tactical value for this situation, the dispute proved an outlet for advertising these technologies. Meanwhile, India is showing that it will not be pushed by China, responding to the border dispute by deploying troops into the region. They have also responded politically by sanctioning numerous Chinese apps, including TikTok, which has more than 200 million users in India. Add to that the skipping of the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics held in Beijing. To put it simply, the border dispute between India and China is one that is very important, given the role that both countries play in the region and globally. The combination of mistrust, a desire to exude dominance, and an ambiguous border has the potential to lead to a war eventually. However, in the meantime, India and China will likely maintain the standoff with little resolution. What has been proven is that the border issue has the ability to affect bilateral matters. And so as time goes on, we'll see just how much the border issues can affect the two most powerful nations in Asia. Okay, with that out of the way, let's move on to India's next conflict in the region. This one, unlike the other three and more like the rest to follow, is not as well known, but it remains an area of contention nonetheless. Let's talk about this country right here, Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a very interesting case for India, and perhaps one of their most fragile to handle cases in the region. You see, India is both a friend to Afghanistan and something else. It's to a point where, in a survey, about 60% of Afghanis view India as their closest ally. So, where is the geographic crisis with the nation then? Well, that comes in one word, Taliban. You see, India sided with the Americans in the Afghanistan war, and profited handsomely from contracts to build buildings, roads, and schools, and provide supplies to the foreign troops. After the withdrawal of the American military in August of 2021, and the fall of the Afghanistan government, the Taliban returned to power throwing India's diplomatic position into uncertainty. What do you do when the side you fought against wins the war? That has been the conundrum. Since then, however, India has made small steps towards establishing a working relationship with the Taliban-ruled Afghanistan administration. 
A combination of geopolitical and strategic concerns may have led to this development. There's a reason why India strives to maintain a foothold and friendly relations with Afghanistan. You see, India has a sizable diplomatic presence in Afghanistan, and long maintained a close relationship with the country on the basis of historical and cultural ties. This relationship has also been aimed at circumventing Pakistan. To this end, of a prosperous and stable Afghanistan, India never recognized Afghanistan's first Taliban government, which came to power in 1996, and did not maintain a diplomatic mission in the country from 1996 to 2001. Instead of interacting with Taliban leaders, New Delhi supported the anti-Taliban resistance in Afghanistan, hence its alignment with the U.S. offensive missions. After the overthrow of the Taliban in 2001 following the U.S. invasion of the country, India lent its support to successive governments in Kabul and provided aid for growth and development. With the resurgence of the Taliban in 2003, however, India and its projects in Afghanistan came under increasing attack. The Indian consulate was attacked several times while Indian employees and workers on various projects were abducted or killed. In 2002, after the Taliban regime was overthrown, Hamid Karzai took over as president of Afghanistan. Kabul maintained a pro-India position and Afghanistan and Pakistan largely had poor relations up until 2014, when Karzai's successor, Ashraf Ghani, took over as president. The power-sharing agreement of the new Taliban-led regime that took over in August of 2021 was seen as beneficial to Pakistan, without whose active support it was unlikely that Taliban leaders could have negotiated the Doha Agreement. The Doha Agreement, signed between the United States and the Taliban, laid out the terms and conditions of the withdrawal of the American military from the country. But things seem to have changed since then, as the Taliban seem to have changed sides since that time. You see, because Pakistan is not stable as it faces its own political crisis, the Taliban seems to favor India despite their history. The Taliban has rejected the legitimacy of the Durand Line, the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, and has also targeted Pakistanis working on the construction of a border fence. The Taliban's protection of the Tariq-e-Taliban Pakistan, also known as the Pakistan Taliban, is adding to tensions. The Tariq-e-Taliban Pakistan is an umbrella organization of armed militant groups. On November 28th, the Tariq-e-Taliban Pakistan ended its five-month ceasefire with the Pakistan government, brokered by the Afghanistan Taliban, and announced that its fighters would resume attacks. So, what's India's position amongst all this? Well, in the interest of maintaining geopolitical balance, India has to deal with the Taliban-led regime in Afghanistan. The internal upheaval in Pakistan and the diminished impacts of the United States and Russia in the region might account for the change in India's position. With the Afghan people at the heart of India's motives, peace with Taliban is all but necessary. The Taliban has also made it very clear that it promotes and welcomes any Indian diplomatic missions as it wants better relations between the two governments. At a time of political and economic strife in several South Asian countries, India has had a stable, functioning government, making it of significant importance to the Taliban. India is also a strong, large, and powerful ally to have. It's crucial to the Taliban to have a friend in India over an enemy. Through investments in Afghanistan, India also has some support among segments of the Afghan population, which could be of advantage to the Taliban as well. On the other hand, India also greatly benefits from Afghanistan's strategic location, which grants access to land routes with Central Asia. Further, there are Pakistan-backed terrorist organizations operating in Afghanistan that have targeted India, the Haqqani Network, for instance. New Delhi's engagement with the Taliban could be aimed at stopping Pakistan from installing a pro-Pakistan administration in Afghanistan, and preventing extremists and other terrorist organizations from mobilizing against India. Also, when you factor in the growing risk that is China, India must be wary of being caught between two hostile neighbors. China's inaction and relative silence over the Taliban suggests that Pakistan will have a role to play in formulating China's policies in Afghanistan. So what India has on its hands is a hot, unstable potato. Too hot to ignore, but too unstable to just outright adopt. The Afghanistan issue is quite the headache in New Delhi, as it mounts on the geographic and geopolitical pressures the nation faces 
in the region. Let's move on to the next of India's geographic issues, Sri Lanka. The conflict with Sri Lanka is over the Kachativu Island, which was formed due to volcanic eruptions in the 14th century. The Raja of Ramnad, present-day Ramnad Tapuram, Tamil Nadu, owned Kachativu Island, and it later became part of the Madras Presidency. In 1921, both Sri Lanka and India claimed this piece of land for fishing, and the dispute remained unsettled. The 285-acre land was jointly administered by India and Sri Lanka during British rule. What has caused the issue over the years is the fact that fishermen of both countries have been fishing in each other's waters without conflict for a very long time. The issue emerged when India and Sri Lanka signed maritime boundary agreements. The agreements marked the international maritime boundary of India and Sri Lanka. The agreement aimed to facilitate resource management and law enforcement in the Palk Strait. Now, Indian fishermen were only allowed to use the island for resting, net drying, and the annual St. Anthony's Festival. They were not permitted to use the island for fishing. However, Indian fishermen continued trespassing over the Sri Lankan water boundary, searching for a better catch in the area. The next few decades went well, but the problem turned serious when fish and aquatic life in the Indian continental shelf depleted, which resulted in an increased number of Indian fishermen in the region. They are also using modern fishing trolleys, which harm marine life and the ecosystem. During the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ilam, a separatist group in Sri Lanka, era, the Sri Lankan government restricted the easy movement of Sri Lankan fishermen in the waters, raising military operations issues. In 2009, Sri Lanka started heavily guarding its maritime boundary in the Palk Strait. It was done to reduce the possibility of the return of the Tamil insurgents to the country. The Indian fishermen considered this an opportunity, but with the end of the war in 2010, Sri Lankan fishermen again started their movement in Polk Bay and reclaimed their lost legitimate territory. The conflict is still ongoing as this matter is considered largely unresolved to satisfaction. There is still tension between the Indian fishermen and villagers in northern Sri Lanka. However, unlike most of the conflicts we've covered, this one can be considered a soft conflict as it does not have heavy repercussions as opposed to the others. In fact, India is Sri Lanka's closest neighbor. The relationship between the two countries is more than 2,500 years old, and both sides have built upon a legacy of intellectual, cultural, religious, and linguistic interaction. In recent years, the relationship has been marked by close contacts at the highest political level, growing trade and investment, cooperation in the fields of development, education, culture, and defense, as well as a broad understanding of major issues of international interest. Bilateral exchanges at various levels over the past year, and significant progress in the implementation of developmental assistance projects for the internally displaced persons and disadvantaged sections of the population in Sri Lanka, have helped further cement the bonds of the friendship between the two countries. The nearly three-decade-long armed conflict between Sri Lankan forces and the LTTE came to an end in May of 2009. During the course of the conflict, India supported the right of the government of Sri Lanka to act against terrorist forces. At the same time, it conveyed at the highest levels its deep concern for the plight of the mostly Tamil civilian population, emphasizing that their rights and welfare should not get enmeshed in hostilities against the LTTE. The need for national reconciliation through a political settlement of the ethnic issues has been reiterated by India at the highest levels. India's consistent position is in favor of a negotiated political settlement, which is acceptable to all communities within the framework of a united Sri Lanka, and which is consistent with democracy, pluralism, and respect for human rights. Overall, we're unlikely to see a war erupt here, but because it is a sensitive matter that faces its citizens, it is a geographic matter that begs addressing. Let's move on to the next nation that will pose a geopolitical and geographic crisis for India, Nepal. Uh, where to start with this? Well, back in 2020, Nepal released a new political map that claims that Kalapani, Limpia Dura, and Lipulik of Uttarakhand as part of Nepal's territory. The area of Susta can also be noted on the new map. In what wasn't an unexpected move, India rejected the new map of Nepal saying that Nepal's new map involves an artificial enlargement of territories, which is not based on historical facts and evidence. The government argued that Nepal's act was a unilateral act and was contrary to the bilateral understanding 
to resolve the outstanding border issues through diplomatic dialogue. The Indian government also urged the government of Nepal to respect India's sovereignty and territorial integrity. In a way, however, India was being hypocritical, given that they had been the ones to instigate the matter. You see, back in May of 2020, India's defense minister inaugurated a motorable link road that connects India and China, significantly reducing the time of the Kalish Mansurova Yatra. The road passes through territory at the Lipo Lake Pass that Nepal claims as its own territory. This was known to be a heated issue, given that earlier Nepal had protested strongly against India when India published a new map that showed the region of Kalapani as part of the Indian territory. Nepal had also expressed displeasure of the 2015 agreement between India and China for using the Lipolik Pass for trade without consulting Nepal. The ongoing border dispute between the two Asian nations currently now covers the tri-junction between India and Nepal in China and the Susta region. Let's touch on all these briefly, shall we? Kalapani is a valley that is administered by India. It's situated on the Kailash Mansurova route. Kalapani is advantageously located at a height of over 20,000 feet and serves as an observation post for that area. The Kali River and the Kalapani region demarcates the border between India and Nepal. The Treaty of Sugoli, signed by the Kingdom of Nepal and British India in 1816, marked the Kali River as Nepal's western boundary with India. The discrepancy in locating the source of the Kali River led to boundary disputes between India and Nepal with each country producing maps supporting their own claims. Let's move to the Susta region. The change of course by the Gondak River is the main reason for the dispute in the Susta area. Susta is located on the bank of the Gondak River and is called the Narayani River in Nepal. It joins the Gangna near Patna Bihar. The Kali River originates from a stream at Limpiadura northwest of Lipo Lake. Thus, Kalapani, Limpiadura, and Lipo Lake fall to the east of the river and are part of Nepal's Darachura district. Lipolek was deleted from the country's maps by the kings to get favors from India. The territory of Kalapani was offered to India by King Mahindra after the 1962 India-China War, who wanted to help India's security concerns due to perceived lingering Chinese threats. Kalapani was not part of the Nepal-India dispute. It was Nepal's territory that the king had allowed India to use temporarily. So far as Nepal is involved, the new map is in fact a document that was in circulation in Nepal till the 1950s. On the other hand, according to India, the narrative is different. The Kali River originates in springs, well below the Lipulek Pass, and the Sugoli Treaty does not demarcate the area north of these streams. The administrative and revenue records of the 19th century also show that Kalapani was on the Indian side, and counted as part of Pitoragar district of Uttarakhand. This difference in narratives causes quite a stalemate. In the 1980s, the two groups set up the Joint Technical Level Boundary Working Group to delineate the boundary. The group demarcated everything except the Kalapani and Susta areas. Officially, Nepal brought the issue of Kalapani before India in 1998. Both sides agreed to demarcate the outstanding areas, including Kalapani, by 2002 at the Prime Ministerial Level talk held in 2000. But that's not happened yet. That is what causes the lingering issues that persist. Though a war is unlikely to happen, the geopolitical ramifications that come with such matters could prove to be a headache to India more than it is now. I would be remiss if I did not mention the last two nations that pose a geopolitical problem with India. Those are Myanmar and Bhutan. Let's start with the former. India has wisely stayed out of Myanmar politics while it has effectively turned smaller neighbors like Nepal, Bhutan, and the Maldives into virtual protectorates with limited authority to act independently. The same is the case with the Maldives, which in recent times has been turned virtually into a vassal state of India, and anti-India sentiments are brewing and boiling over. Anyway, pertaining to Myanmar, the dispute is over a valley in northwest Myanmar and northeast India. India has had a simmering crisis on its northeastern border since the Myanmar military's February 2021 coup d'etat. Over 50,000 civilians have fled across the border from Myanmar into India's northeast. New Delhi has maintained a delicate balancing act, allowing refugees into the country but refraining from political pressure on the junta and its state administrative council. However, the situation in Myanmar continues to worsen. 
India will need to rethink its position before the fallout seriously threatens its interests. A quick glance at this map shows that India's eight northeastern states are connected to the rest of the country by only a thin strip of land, known as the Siriguri Corridor. The region shares a 994-mile-long border with Myanmar, and several Indian communities have ethnic and kinship ties extending into Myanmar. New Delhi sees Myanmar's military as a partner for controlling the border and denying safe haven to Indian rebel groups. The Myanmar military's dysfunctional rule has cultivated an environment where porous borders and armed groups in the hinterland are the norm. Far from denying territory to Indian rebels, the junta is offering them sanctuary in Myanmar in return for fighting the pro-democracy People's Defense Forces and ethnic revolutionary organizations in the Sagayang region. The People's Liberation Army of Manipur and Manipur Naga People's Front, which are fighting the Indian state for separatism or greater autonomy, have used Myanmar territory as a staging ground for attacks on India, including a November 2021 ambush on a convoy of the Assam Rifles, an Indian government-controlled paramilitary force. As evidence of this quiet collaboration, the Myanmar military has withdrawn from a key Indian rebel base it had cleared and occupied in Sagaing, leaving the site free for their use. What's really interesting about this scenario is how China has found a way to slide into this situation. You see, due to geography, Myanmar figures prominently in several dimensions of India's geopolitical rivalry with China. China claims part of India's northeast. Beijing threatened the Siliguri Corridor in the 2017 Doklam standoff and clashed with border guards at Tawang in the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh in December of 2022. On April 2nd, 2023, China's Ministry of Civil Affairs issued a statement that included Arunachal Pradesh as part of Southern Tibet, spurring Indian diplomatic protests. Myanmar is also an essential node for Chinese expansion into the Indian Ocean most notably through the China-Myanmar Economic Corridor's pipelines and several planned railroads. India fears that a weak SAC may become too dependent on China, opening new fronts for pressure and Chinese power projection. However, China is already taking advantage of the post-coup landscape to increase its influence, pledging support to the SAC no matter how the situation changes, while simultaneously stepping up engagement with its allies among the EROs. Since the coup, China has launched a number of new infrastructure projects in Myanmar, transferred jets to the military, and reached a deal for the Yunnan province to provide the SAC with rice and fertilizer. In April, Indian officials confronted the SAC over possible Chinese intelligence facilities on Myanmar's Cocoa Islands, which would provide new capabilities for monitoring naval bases and missile test sites on India's eastern coastline. If India's accommodation of the SAC is intended to limit Chinese influence, that appears to not be working. This situation is critically dangerous for India, and hence presents it with, well, quite a challenge. As if all the problems we've spoken about aren't enough of a crisis for India, there's another one. One that in recent times has gained traction, and that is the Bhutan border issue. The Himalayan nation of Bhutan is nestled between two Asian giants, China and India. Quite the positioning, if you ask me. Bhutan is one of the two countries with which China has yet to resolve its land border dispute. The other country is India, which has a long-running disagreement over its Himalayan frontier with China. The problem that India has now is that China's global rise is putting pressure on Bhutan to reach a deal with Beijing. But any possible breakthrough will need the approval of its ally India, putting India in quite the position. Timpu and Delhi share a close relationship and India has been offering hundreds of millions of dollars of economic and military aid to Timpu. Oh, Timpu is the capital of Bhutan, if you haven't picked that up. Bhutan and China have disputes over territory in the north and west in the Himalayas. Among all the contentious places, the key issue is a strategic plateau called Doklam, situated close to the tri-junction between India, Bhutan, and China. Bhutan and China claim the region, and India supports Tempu's position. India has its own reasons to back Tempu. Experts say the Doklam Plateau is of great security importance to India, as any dominance of the region by the Chinese could pose a threat to the Siliguri Corridor, known as the Chicken's Neck. This is a 14-mile stretch that connects the Indian mainland with its northeastern states. The Bhutanese Prime Minister is quoted as saying about this matter, It is not up to Bhutan alone to solve the problem. We are three. 
There is no big or small country. There are three equal countries, each counting for a third. We are ready. As soon as the other two parties are also ready, we can discuss. Ultimately, I think the truth is simply that India feels cornered. If Bhutan resolves the issues with China, that leaves India in a somewhat precarious position. This adds to the crisis that it already is experiencing in the region. While still on this, I want to touch on another matter that technically counts as a geographic and definitely geopolitical crisis for India. Ever since Russia attacked Ukraine and the war started, India has not condemned Russia in the least. To make it worse on the international stage, when called into action, India has declined to answer. India's three consecutive abstentions, two at the UN Security Council and one at the UN Human Rights Council, regarding condemning Putin's gambit, have created significant heartburn in the West. India's silence, as the director of the US Council of Foreign Affairs, Richard Haas, argued, highlights that it remains unprepared to step up to major power responsibilities or be a dependable partner. As an article from Think China says, for the West, India is on the wrong side of history, both materially and morally. New Delhi, however, believes that it is simply on the wrong side of geography. You see, for one, India's primary concern is China and the Indo-Pacific. What happens in Europe is marginal to its fundamental interests. This geographic dissociation is compounded by Russia being the principal instigator of the current crisis, on which India is heavily dependent for its military supplies. India has diversified its military imports by sourcing equipment from Western vendors, such as the US, Israel, and France in the last two decades. However, the legacy of India's Cold War dependence on Moscow for its military needs continues apace, with almost 86% of Indian military equipment sourced from Russia. You tend to not want to rile up your supplier in such instances. Moscow is also India's preferred source for advanced military technology and weaponry. Russian assistance has been vital in India's nuclear submarine program and the development of the Brahmas cruise missile. Moreover, the Russian S-400 air defense system is critical for India in future contests with China and Pakistan. So in a time where there is already heavy isolation for Russia, crossing Putin may fundamentally upset India's military readiness especially when confronting a potent and aggressive adversary on its northern frontier. It's quite the predicament, and it makes for quite the crisis. It will be interesting to see how India maneuvers these hurdles. Drop a comment in the comment section if you have any thoughts on how any of these border crises could be rectified.